Good morning. My name is Tony, and I'm an assistant dean in Hofstra School of Health Professions and Human Services. I'm delighted that after months of planning, close, close work with Senator Hannon, and our panel of experts, to be able to say to all of you gathered here today and to all joining us on our live stream, welcome to the inaugural event in the State of Hope series. The acronym of HOPE in the title of our event stands for Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange. It is the manifestation of the vision of Senator Hannon to bring a public forum or exchange of ideas on important topics in healthcare to the greater Long Island region. I would like to thank and acknowledge Hofstra's Provost Office and Division of University Relations for today's support of our event. Our event is not possible without the support of our Provost Office and Division of University Relations. I would also like to thank Senator Hannon, with whom I have worked closely over the, the past several months leading up to today. Senator Hannon, it has been a pleasure to have been given the opportunity to work with and most impor importantly learn from you. I am in awe at your continued dedication to public service, to the health and well-being of the residents of New York, and at your energy. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Dean for the School of Health Professions and Human Services at Hofstra, Dr. Holly Syrup. Dean Syrup has been a member of the Hofstra community for over 36 years and has served in a variety of leadership roles, namely having been the Executive Dean of Students, Vice President for Campus Life, Vice Dean, and most recently, the Dean for the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Dean Syrup is also a jointly appointed professor in the Department of Counseling and Mental Health Professions and with the Educational Policy and Leadership Program. Dean Syrup, I welcome you to the podium. Thank you, Tony, um, and good morning, everyone. In the last 10 years, Hofstra has made a very conscious and intentional decision to focus in on health, all of the health professions, first by opening the, school, the Zucker School of Medicine, the Graduate School of Nursing and Physician Assistant Studies, and the School of Health Professions and Human Services. Together, we are proud that we are educating and training key members of the healthcare future of tomorrow. Interprofessional dialogue and community engagement is part of our overarching mission, and this program serves as a great example of reaching that goal. And I want to say thank you for joining us, and welcome to this inaugural event of the State of Hope series. As Tony mentioned, HOPE is an acronym for Health Care Opportunities Policy Exchange, and the goal of the State of Hope is to bring people together to discuss current trends, to share ideas and innovation, and to consider the impact of these on current policy and future policy. As we all know, this is a time of great change in health, and we need to continue to bring people to together to increase awareness, to address the gaps, and to really begin to, to advocate for strong support and change. And what better place is there to bring people together than a university, which is, at its core is a place for students, faculty, and the community to come together to learn and to share ideas. And what better way to begin a program like this but to be discussing the social determinants of health. I want to thank our panel, David Nimiroff, Ram Raju, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, who are here to share their expertise this morning. Their bios are in your program. I'm not going to read their whole bios, but they are all amazing people, experts in the field. And the fact that they've taken their time to share with us today, we really want to thank you, not only today, but for being part of our inaugural event. And of course, I want to thank Kemp. Kemp joined HPHS as our first uh, Health Policy Fellow in April of 2019. After a distinguished career and healthcare policy leader in New York State Senate, he is known for working across party lines to put health and the well-being of others first. Kemp's career in public service directly mirrors the HPHS mission to create a more health equitable world for all through the education of future leaders in the clinical, policy, research, and advocacy setting. So now I have the pleasure of asking Kemp to come forward to give opening remarks.
Good morning. Thanks for being here. Thanks for putting up with the delay. I thought we were, I got out of politics, I wouldn't be taking pictures anymore. Uh, um, wallet sizes are available for all of us. We, um, we're delighted here to kind of kick off this first forum. Uh, the thought is to be able to explore in an academic way, a non-institutional way, some of the things that are forces of change in, in health. To the extent that we're open for suggestions as to topics, we would be delighted to hear from you. That would, that's, that's all part of the ongoing uh, community and academic nature here at Hofstra. If we were talking about health uh, 10 years ago, we might have been opening up a lecture on uh, how to better fee for service, how to better bill, how to better account for the things that were done with a patient. We've moved light years from there, but we're not landed yet. The, uh, we're now into value-based care, which is a much more ambiguous, much more or less defined, uh, set of goals, and it is what it's saying is we're going to be looking at the whole care package in order to reimburse the people who are the care providers. Doing that becomes a lot more difficult because it's not government that's looking for the metrics, although they're interested in, in value-based care also, but it's the entities who are running the providers. Uh, it is the hospitals. It is the nursing homes. It is the uh, federally qualified health centers. It's the community-based organizations. How do they know where they're going to be putting their best efforts? What's, what will make the best difference in regard to improving patient care? So there's more definitions of social determinants out there that I can shake a stick at. But these, what we have this morning, are three individuals who are in the course of providing care and guiding their institutions to providing that care. Each of them are CEOs, and traditionally, um, you might think, well, they're just management, they're just keeping people happy, they're just hiring people. They go, I can personally tell you, they go well beyond that because they are trying to help shape the delivery of health care. And it's happening right here. I don't think it gets enough attention on Long Island. Uh, you can do a couple of the big foundations in the city, but it, there's actual progress and change happening here. So I'm delighted that we can kick this off. And uh, for our first speaker this morning, uh, Dr. Ram Raju. Thank you, Kemp. And uh, Dean, thank you very much for the opportunity to do that. And uh, I have a great pleasure with uh, my co-panelists, two of the great individuals uh, who shape healthcare in, in Long Island and further. So let me start with uh, myself. If you had asked me 20 years ago, more than probably I know, 30 years ago, that I would be standing here talking about social determinants health, I would probably be amused. <laughs> because in my first part of training in England, I was a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon. And you can't get more specialists than that, right? So I never knew anything about primary care. I didn't know nothing about health. Right, I just interested in a, in a kid's heart. That's how I want, right, as a part of it. But what changed over a period of time, right? What changed was a life experience. When I was in New York City Health and Hospitals, right, in the first stint under Mayor Bloomberg, this is a woman who came in for the with the breast cancer, and the breast cancer was she was very very, and I got took a personal interest in her because she is an an undocumented immigrant, lived in the country for 30 years, put her children to school. They went to college, and she worked very, very hard for many years, extremely religious, and she properly dressed, and extremely grateful to this country for what it has given to her and the children. So she comes in, gets a uh, cancer surgery done, and then subsequently supposed to have chemotherapy, and does not show up for chemotherapy. In healthcare, we have a, a, a nomenclature for these people. We call them non-compliant patients, because you're not compliant. You really don't want to get better. You're a bad dude. Right? Then I took a little interest and found out the reason she was not able to come there because she lives in an apartment and the landlord wants to rent the apartment to hire somebody who pays higher rent. And she basically was being kicked out of the apartment, but she, she was told she has got no recourse because she's the undocumented immigrant. If you go to the police, they're going to put you back in a, in a van and send you back to where you come from. 
So she has an opportunity. She or she is has to decide between having chemotherapy and hopefully cancer will be a remission, or become homeless. So this is a choice she is, she faces, and she chose not to be homeless. Right? This in a country where we spend so much of money, so much of energy, so much of great things in there means nothing to her if she cannot get the care she gets and, the, and what is standing in between her and the care is a predatory landlord affecting, uh, creating a hostile environment for her that she is undocumented immigrant, she will be pushed out of her apartment. That is a social determinant of health. And that changed my entire life and I said, okay, fine, why is this is happening? So 19 years ago when I first started talking about it, it was very difficult because a lot of people did not understand what it is. They said this is social services, there is health, there is nothing common between them. Why are you saying that homelessness is actually related to the health? It has got nothing to do with that. There are two different things, right? One is social issue, one is health issue. But over a period of time, we, we came across and we did a lot of good things as it happened. As I studied this, one of the things which is very, very common was I was, uh, for a time being, I was at Chicago running the Cook County Health System, right? Uh, one of the third largest public systems in the country for Ram Anwar. This is the story, right? If you happen to be in the south side of Cook County, you, your longevity is 69 years old. If you go to the north side of Cook County, Chicago, you're 81 years old. So 12 years you get by just crossing over the river, Chicago River, which is like a, not a Mississippi. It's just a small street. You can actually jump over it, <laughs> right? And that's not only here. I can show you this map for every part of the country. This is New York City, right? If you're on Upper West Side, your longevity is 84 years old. And if you go to the Bronx, your longevity drops automatically. Bedford Stuy, same thing. If you live in Park Slope, your longevity is, you get 10 years more in your life. If you happen to move into East New York, Bedford Stuy, you lose 14 years of your life. I couldn't understand why, because we give the best care. We don't differentiate. Oh, you come up Upper West Side, I'm going to give you the best medicine. You come from Bronx, I'm not going to give you that. We give the best medicine to everybody. So there is something more than what we have. And that, took the, I, that journey took me 19 years to figure out. Initially, I thought it was access. If you give everybody more access, people will come in. We created a lot of access in Chicago, didn't make a difference. Then I thought it's all about cultural competency. So we teach everybody to be culturally competent. So we trained everybody. Every healthcare organization trained everybody in cultural competency. We knew it's not going to work because it's just a stupid idea, right? Because you can't make somebody culturally competent by giving them a 14 slide, 15 minutes lecture, and we say, hey, you're all culturally competent, right? It, it doesn't make sense. But it gets you through joint commission, but that's, that's the only thing it does, right? <laughs> Nothing more than that. Then we thought it's about inclusion, you know, all these things. But then finally we came upon it is not about the person. It's not about the treatment. We consistently discount the person who receives the treatment. And that's the reason why in the richest country we spend so much of money in healthcare in this country, right? $8,000 we spend close to every year in healthcare. The healthcare budget in this country is over $3 trillion over a period of time. The reason is because one of the things came out was we spend less and less on social services and more and more on the health care. It's not health care, really, sick care, right? Because if you're, if you're not sick, I'm not interested in you. Right? Hospitals are only for sick people, right? So this, this, why is this is happening? What is the reason for it? Then we figured out, for all the time, we have only worked on the systems and we best the best treatment, best care, best chemotherapy, best devices to the patients. But we did not care about where they go back. So in other words, you have a great seed. You prepare the seed very well. But you throw them in the soil, which is not good for them, wherever they go from. You treat the asthma with the best medication. You send them back to the same apartment, which produced asthma in the first place because of mold or a rodent. You are not doing anything. You are basically creating a system by which you actually make a lot of money, but you are not getting people better over a period of time. So this is not the seed. It's also the soil which makes a difference as you move into this, right? So that was a, the soil is social determinants. We know more about your diabetes. I know less about yourself. I know very little about your family. I know nothing about where you come from. We give you instructions, right? I was in Chicago, I used to say, hey, go and walk half a mile. 
right, in, in the south of Chicago. The guy says, I can't walk half a mile because I'll be get shot. <laughs> right? My chance of dying half a mile walk in south Chicago at the time is equal to dying 90% death. Right? So we kind of, in the doctors, we kind of throw out the instructions, keep doing this, keep doing that, do that, do that. But we never really figure out whether they can able to do that or not. What social issues they have which prevents them from doing it. It happens in New York City. If you live in a fourth floor walk-up apartment and you are basically a prisoner in your own apartment because you cannot walk down every day, four floors or go up and then also walk half a mile, right? That's not going to work. So that is a soil. So we need to change the lens. We always look to the patient's healthcare lens. You change the lens and say, look at the healthcare through the patient lens. A completely different thing emerges as a part of it. What it means is these are things, right? Only 20% of the outcomes in this country are done by the doctors and the healthcare organizations. All the great things, the $3 trillion we invest is only for this 20%. All the investments we made in the, in the last 50, 60 years in the healthcare, all the advancements we made. 40%, 80% is social determinants. 40% of social determinants, 80% is health literacy. Let's not confuse patient education with health literacy. Literacy is very different from patient education. And 40%, other 40% is social issues. These are social issues which really impacts on that. And this has been proven multiple times over a period of time, saying that if you do not work on this 80%, your 20% are going to carry the patient through all the way through. So that simply means we have to change the focus of the healthcare delivery systems. At the present time, the healthcare delivery systems are on the, on the, on the left, you know, you are, you are left, right, uh, left hand side, right? We all do how well we do. We never calculate how well they got. That's never was an issue in that. And we always ask them the wrong question. We always ask them, what is matter with you? The question is probably what matters to you at the end of the day. And we build clinical excellence. Everybody competes with everybody else. I have the best cardiologist. I know I have a better cardiologist. You know, I have this great machine which can take care of you. I have this new machine which takes care of your prostate cancer. Right? I know I got a better deal than that. All clinical excellence. We have to move the organization from clinical excellence to a total health organization. If you want to move that, then you need to address it. It's a centerpiece of, of clinical care, what we, what we need to do as an organization. So, the, the, we have to do a few things because this is not a funded opportunity because healthcare are on thin margins. Nobody is going to do these things when there is no money in that. So what we need to do is we need to change the policy. The policy should be paying not only for how sick you are and also how socially ill-equipped you are. Because if you have a diabetic patient with a similar case mix index or a similar uh, you know, issues like your diabetes, high blood pressure, high, you know, and you have a high cholesterol. But if you happen to live in a zip code X and a zip code Y, the costs are different because zip code X is better equipped and zip code Y is not there. So zip code matters at the end of the day. So we need to figure out how to pay for it. Then we need to have the managed care organizations basically involved in creating health. So we need to really work with the managed care organizations to be able to deal with that. And Every hospital under the ACA has got to declare the community benefit dollars. We need to really spend the community benefit dollars in a much better way. We cannot be just spending community benefit dollars on just you know, giving out a balloons and charge keys and a couple of things in their health fairs, right, and then walk away the next day. And then we say, okay, we tick the box saying, oh, we have done a community service. What have we done? Oh, I just had this health fair. I gave out 100 balloons, right, and a couple of things in there. Oh, okay, fine. That's not a community benefit. Community benefits really work on food insecurity of an area, work on social public safety in the area, work on transportation issues in the area. Those are the areas where we need to have community benefit dollars. And the last part of it is also foundations. Private foundations need to come in there. Every organization has got to do what we call as a corporate social responsibility, CSR, which is mandated by the federal government. A lot of people don't know how to do that. In fact, we had a conversation with JetBlue, so I asked them, because they called me in and said, we have the CSR, how do we work with you? I said, what do you do now? Oh, our CSR is whenever this hurricane comes in, we fly people, healthcare workers free of charge. I said, you can do better than that. You're in Long Island City. 
right? One of the major food deserts there, and there's a huge issues with that. So you can, pollution is a major issue. You can work on those things. So there is an opportunity to link your programs with some of the corporate social responsibilities. Citibank wants to give the financial security to people, which is a major issue. If you are an undocumented immigrant, you cannot start a bank account. You cannot cash your check in the bank. You got to go to these money cashing areas where you lose up to 10% of a check. It's not a big check to start with. You probably get like $60, $70, and then you give away like $10 of that, of that just to cash your check. There must be a mechanism for us to be able to work it better as a part of it. So what we have done in Northwell is quickly, last couple of slides, we cannot just, we have to move this program from tugging on your heart to appealing to your brain. We need to have a metrics. We need to show how risk you are. How do you calculate your risk in a better way? So we are creating a, what we call social vulnerability index. We are actually in Northwell collecting the data. It's a 15 question questionnaire. We collect data about the social issues, and then we put them through this algorithm, and then it assigns you a code saying that you have a, this is a social risk. Because we can't take up every social risk, so we need to identify a threshold. So we are planning to do is a one to 10 social, one being the lowest and 10 being the highest. You have a threshold of six. If you cross a six, automatically there's a program called NowPow, which is being, being looked at and implemented now. It basically picks up your social issues and then refers you to the community-based organizations and other government agencies so they can address it for you. And then they commit back into that. So that Northwell, the, the dream of Northwell is that as you come in, I'm going to ask you about diabetes, I'm going to ask you about allergies, I'm going to ask you about medication, VM, I am also going to ask you about social issues you got. That should be the way. And I, once I collect the information, I'll be able to assign a risk score to you. And based on risk score, I'm going to take care of you. Again, not by us, by involving other partners who are very good at it than the healthcare leaders by themselves, right? So these are the four areas where you have done some work. Food as health, because we believe that every hospital should have a food pharmacy so that we are able to give the food. So we started Valley Stream. We are working with a lot of organizations, including David, who was very much instrumental in getting it done. So we are basically able to give medically tailored food to people ability to you know, get them. Because if you are living in, a, you live in a food desert, that means you live in an area where there's in five miles around, you don't have a grocery store, and you don't have a car, you are basically cooked, literally. right? Because the thing which is available to you is a fast food. So I, in, the, in, the, in the healthcare, we always treat the social issues with the more medications. You're a diabetic, you come back to me, your, your blood sugar is not under control. The next thing I do is, I have two things I do. First, I yell at you, <laughs> right? Once I start finish yelling at you, then I say, I'm going to give you more medication, right? I got to increase your medicine. I don't ask you, did you able to get the food? No, no, my food stop is five miles away. I don't have a car. I can't walk away with the groceries. Especially Nassau County and Suffolk County has got uh, transportation issues all across the place. In fact, uh, Levy is uh, going to work with us on some of these issues, suburban issues. And the second one was substance abuse and illness. This is a, a plan we did it for, uh, for Staten Island and subsequently taken over by the governor as, as a plan. Opioid crisis is a huge issue, but again, healthcare alone cannot solve this issue. By asking doctors not to write more prescriptions, he's not going to solve the problem. Because this is an economic issue. This is a criminal justice issue. It's a safety issue. There are many, many issues involved. So in Staten Island, we brought everybody together, right? And we were completely flabbergasted because we have like 84 organizations working on, and they have like 150 metrics. So no doubt we don't know if they're doing better or not because one metric is doing better, the other one not there. So first thing we did was we brought everybody together and agreed on the measurements. That's what we need to social determinants. You have to really figure out what the measurements are, then you align your program to that. That's not the way we do things. We select a program, then we come out with the metrics for the program. So we have to really do this very differently. We say, okay, I am here to do the food desert. I'm going to eliminate food desert by 20%. Then you have a program aligned with that. So that then you'll be able to get something to that. Anchor Institution is one of the 
it came in just before I joined Northwell. You know, in the, at the national level, we believe that hospital systems are the major, major provider of economy in the neighborhoods. They are doing more than that. So this was started in, the, in Washington, D.C. as a part of it. We are one of the founder members. And what we said was we asked the organization, healthcare organizations, to say, employ locally, hire locally, buy locally, and invest in locally because you are the major portion of the economy locally. So instead of going and doing that, get this your, your, for your breakfast with your senior staff, get the, break, what do you call it, just uh, get the food from the local deli. Get a, give an opportunity for the local painter to paint your office, right? Create local economy as a part of it. And that's a part of anchor institutions, which, which are about 25 organizations across the country, and we are one of them, and we are basically saying, you cannot purely be a healthcare leader. You've got to be a social change agent. Your, your, your job does not end by just providing healthcare. You've got to do more than that. And the last one is, of course, health literacy is a major issue, right? We are trying to figure out because our major health literacy, we've done a poor job. The patient education, the best thing we could do in the last 40 years, now we print the pamphlets in five different languages. That's the only advancement we have made in the last 50 years. We are really figuring out how to do this better. Because people don't read them. People read differently. People read from their smartphones. Some people are le read, some people understand by reading documents. Some people are podcasts. Some people are visual. So we need to figure out how to create an environment where they're able to appreciate it. So we have started some pilot project with the colonoscopy in, in you know, uh, instructions at, uh, at Northwell. And we have results. Hopefully, that will make them more involved in the care, help the literacy as a part of it. So the last slide is. This is the most important. You can, everybody talks health equity. You cannot create health equity in this country unless you have social equity. And the social equity comes with the economic opportunity. In, all of us agree, whichever side or spectrum you are in, economic opportunities are very, very important, right? So that is the only way we can, we can do that. So any opportunity we get, we, we cannot just create health equity in isolation. Health equity is closely tied to social equity. And social equity comes in only if you have an economic opportunity. If you improve the economy of the, re of the region, automatically comes. Harlem is a great example of that, right? Create jobs, create a new system, people come in, right? And then automatically they, they, they get jobs, then the health comes up with that. So at the end of the day, this is a great journey, uh, which has come a long way in this. Hopefully, this, will this kind of forums will create an awareness and change the policies of the government, be able to at least reward health. Please don't keep rewarding sickness. Then I have no interest in keeping you healthy. Because if I benefit from a sickness, that's what I will be do, because that's where the money is, right? So thank you for the opportunity, and it has been a great pleasure. And hopefully, we'll be ready for your questions at a later time. Thank you. And we, we will be taking questions um, after the speakers have done their initial presentations. Next, Patrick O'Shaughnessy, Catholic Health System. Um, you're on. Okay, I'm on. <laughs> Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Senator, thank you. Dean, thank you as well. Tony and uh, my esteemed panelists, I'm truly humbled and, and honored. By, uh, by the way, there's seats in the front. It's not SeaWorld. You won't get wet, I, I promise. Come on in, have a seat. Um, I noticed my friend here has a Yankee hat. So for all of our Yankee fans here, it, it made me think of Yogi Berra. What did Yogi Berra say? It's deja vu all over again. And colleagues, thank you for the incredible work that you do. You're obviously here because you are passionate and committed about improving the health of our population. So um, a few things, I'll share a little bit about me, and then I'll get into Catholic Health uh, System and what we're working on to try to improve the health of the population here, working with colleagues uh, on Long Island. Um, like Dr. Raju, I, um, as a clinician, I was an emergency traumatologist, right? So there were two really embarrassing times in my life. My first was my first day of school, when my mom packed everything for me and I showed up and all the kids looked at me and said, Oh my God, what do you have all around you? All these other things that you're wearing. The second time was my first day of residency uh, in emergency medicine because I was the trauma guy. I went into emergency medicine because I wanted to make a difference. 
I felt I could impact people where they were having acute myocardial infarction, trauma. I showed up, I had every widget in my pocket. I was ready to place lines and tubes and, and take on the world, so to speak. Boy, um, was I mistaken. Right? I mean, you know, when you look at it, yes, you know, whether you're pediatric, uh, open heart surgery, emergency trauma medicine, you do make a difference. But what I realized in the time that I practiced emergency medicine, by the way, I worked in almost every emergency room, and I'm a native Long Islander. I born and, was born and raised here, and I'm so proud and privileged to be on Long Island trying to help impact care. But I've worked in Manhattan, Eeyore's, Queens, Bronx, Nassau, Suffolk, you name it. Academic EDs to the smallest community EDs. And like Dr. Raju had shared, you see the same things over and over again. And I used to ask my patients one simple question, what brought you to me today? And how can I help you? And the answer was never linear. And what I realized was the overarching majority of what led people to the emergency room were driven by the social determinants of health. Did they have enough food? Did they have access to housing? Were they able to even afford and take their medications? And so you start looking at the overall chronic disease burden in the United States, and that's why I'm so really happy to be here today with Senator Hanna and the work that, that he's done and continues to do because public policy influences health care outcomes. It's clear. When you look at the overall spend, and my colleagues will, will share the numbers as well, everyone will say, we need to bend the cost curve. We're approaching 20% of the GDP. It's non-sustainable. But guess what? If you're going to bend the cost curve, you got to bend the disease curve. And that's not easy to do. you got to get upstream of it. So there I was in the ED or maybe in the OR thinking, we're going to make a difference. We're going to make a difference. And we did. But it was a smaller slice of it. You have to get upstream of it. You have to begin to influence the things that drive chronic disease burden. Two articles, I won't make this talk overly academic. Two articles, if you have not read them, read them. The deja vu piece I spoke to before. In 2007, Stephen Schroeder published a piece in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, and it said, we can do better improving the health of the American people. That was over 10 years ago. And we're still here. And you know what was interesting in that article, what uh, Mr. Schroeder spoke to, was the fact that overall, when you look at premature death in the United States, do you know what the major impact drivers are? It's funny, in my position, I thought, well, it's healthcare. Healthcare, we can reduce <coughs> premature death and disease burden. Only 10% is driven by what we do in the acute care and healthcare environment. Social determinants, whether it be behavioral, uh, economic, all of that drive, 60% of all of that driving early death in the United States. Take a look at that article. If you have not read it, you'll say to yourself, it is deja vu all over again. The other piece of that article that's really impressive, maybe as we get into the open panel, is public policy does make an impact and change. Look at smoking and tobacco use. Look at the issues we had with disease burden relative to that from the 40s and 50s to today. I'm going to leave vaping aside. Many of us were involved with uh, helping Governor Cuomo and stand behind that decision, wonderful decision to, to put that ban in place uh, because of vaping lung injury, especially in our youth. But we made tremendous impacts because of public policy to smoking cessation taxation for cigarettes, smoke-free zones, all these things that drive behavior that led to reductions in overall smoking. Second article, if you have not read this, uh, Commonwealth Fund, uh, which is mirror, mirror on the wall. You all read that? Have you, been, have you read that? Take a look at that. You'll see the same thing that we're all speaking to today about why the social determines and why we are spending more in the United States, but our outcomes are not as great. So um, I'm thrilled to be with you here today. I'm very passionate about population health because I think this is the leading edge of healthcare. Uh, we are making differences and really going after quality, which is great, value-based care, as the senator shared. So we're paying for quality, uh, moving uh, away from fee-for-service and into fee-for-value. For but we do also need to drive 
better adherence to improving the social determinants of health. What is the one area of the medical history that gets the least attention from my clinical colleagues in the room? The social history. As a medical student, it was the piece where I said, oh, I gotta do the social history. Are you married? Do you smoke? Do you drink? Is that enough? It is nowhere near enough. And I'll share a little bit more about what we're doing at Catholic Health and others. Health systems have all done this. There is so much information that we can gather in that section that can help guide care. And so I just want to open your eyes to say we're not always looking at the right things. We have to begin to look at the right things and then enact public policy to drive change. And that's why we're all here today. So a little bit about uh, CHS. Uh, we're that other health system on Long Island. You know, so uh, sorry. What's the name again? What's the name again? That's true. So, so, but look, all these things, they cross company lines. Ladies and gentlemen, we're all here because we are humanists at heart, right? We care about the human condition. We want to make people healthier. But we impact a large proportion of the Long Island population. I'm not going to go in through all the detail here. Uh, our footprint spans pretty much from eastern Queens out to Suffolk, eastern Suffolk County. I am going to focus a little bit on this because this was one of the key areas where the senator said, you know, Patrick really would like you to focus on all the drivers. Dr. Raju spoke to a lot of these things. I was completely um, not appreciative of the overall driving impact of these uh, areas on overall health and wellness. So you can imagine uh, the, the impact of food deserts, food insecurity. How about food literacy? Food literacy, what are we putting in our breakfast? By the way, Tony, great choice. Some really healthy items here uh, for breakfast. I didn't see you know, trays of bacon and everything else, so way to go. <laughs> but it's not just the fact that so many Long Islanders um, do not have access to food. It's the food choices, if they even do have access to food. The plethora of fast food options that are available. And you have to ask yourself, well, why? And it's because they are the most affordable options. So that drives into the fact that we have to afford equal education. So all folks have an opportunity to earn a good income. We all want the same things. Incredibly important. Transportation, public transportation. Ron mentioned a, bu a bunch about that. If folks can't get to a food store to buy food, uh, they're not, gonna, they're not gonna do it. If they can't get out and exercise, one of the things I do with my wife every night, we come, we walk my little dog. I was a big dog guy. We have this little fur ball now. He's about that big. But we walk the dog. We get out there, we walk. So I could have a 12, 14 hour day. That's the thing we do at night, no matter what time it is. So I'm getting out there. But if you're afraid to go out in your environment for a variety of reasons, you're not gonna exercise or you're less likely to exercise. So very, very important. Violence ties <coughs> into that social support. Uh, so all these things are major, major drivers. We have to focus more on that. And behavioral economics, ladies and gentlemen, drives all of this. That comes from public policy, tying into how CMS is going to reward or penalize or remunerate health system and providers getting upstream. So it's not just the payment for the cardiac cath. It's not just the payment for the total joint. I'm not saying that we should reduce or eliminate payments. I think we're on a good pay for value stream there. But we're not incenting for health. It is a system of sick care. So we have to begin to think, maybe we should pay a little more for that social history. Maybe we should do more things like paying things for like annual wellness visits, right? CMS had kicked that off. That's a major impact now. That's a billable event. Our providers now are doing that. And guess what we're finding? We're catching disease earlier. So maybe we could bend that disease curve. Really, really important. So we are part of the Long Island Health Collaborative. I won't get into all the detail around that. All of my colleagues are part of that. This is a, this is a great coalition to help drive uh, enhanced population health throughout Long Island. We try to be very active in the community regarding cultural competency, health literacy, uh, and chronic disease self-management programs, uh, which really, when you look at this, and it's a great piece. I remember down at Institute for Healthcare Improvement, I had the privilege to meet Dr. Atul Gawande one year, amazing guy, and he gives this whole d discussion around why some things in healthcare move forward really well and uh, why others don't. Uh, and the conversation was really around the fact that today, 
we, uh, healthcare costs more because we have in increases in new innovative technologies. So 30, 40 years ago, uh, you had a major heart attack, you got an aspirin, you sat in a CCU bed, and you either lived or you died. Now we're doing things like precision angioplasty and whatnot. So the things are going to cost more. So the only way to reduce overall cost burden is to reduce disease burden. Imagine if you got to that patient ahead of time and you bended the opportunity to develop atherosclerosis. Or if you were really aggressive in going after your pre-diabetic population and managing those hemoglobin A1Cs before people develop diabetic retinopathy, nephropathy, and what have you. That's where we have to focus. Instead of reacting to disease and treating disease, get upstream of it. You're going to always need health care providers. You're going to always need people to provide treatment for sick care. We're just not focused on health care. A uh, couple of programs that we do that are, that are somewhat unique. Um, we do have a Healthy Sundays program. Uh, this is a way that we reach out to communities. So we partner with all of uh, churches on Long Island, and we um, offer free access to care uh, for the folks that uh, do not have access to uh, traditional health care service, and, we, and then we plug them in, right? So it's one of the things that I, I would love. The, the most, uh, I get emotional about this. I used to have patients say to me all the time in the ED, can you be my doctor because you care? And you know what I would say to them? I'd say with all respect, I hope I never see you again because this is the emergency room. I want to get you out of the ED. I need to have you find a great primary care doctor, someone to take care of you and your family. But for so many thousands of people, I was their doctor. They had nowhere else to go. So again, um, we're trying to expand access to care. Three major drivers in healthcare, right? Quality, access, cost, period. Always have been, always will be. So access, incredibly important. Increasing clinic exposure for us. Uh, we're trying to pull people in. We even have mobile outreach vans. Uh, one of the main ones at St. Francis, we go out and we screen for uh, cardiac issues, blood pressure. Uh, we do finger stick glucose testing, cholesterol, all these things, PSA tests. We're trying to make people more aware. And again, the key to this is engaging people in their care. They have to be in charge of their care. Put them at the center of it, engage them, and involve them. A whole host of uh, wellness programs we provide, I won't get into these. Uh, I, do, I do think it's very important that continued interaction between health systems and community-based organizations are vitally important uh, as we try to uh, improve overall health and wellness uh, for our um, uh, patients in our communities. So a lot of work going on there, uh, especially on Long Island. We've done a lot of work with the heroin and opioid epidemic uh, in terms of increasing access to care. You know, as an ED provider, um, and again, this goes beyond prescription writing, but we would see so many times patients would come in and you're trained as an ED provider, you treat the overdose or you treat the acute withdrawal. But remember, people are coming to you because they're in crisis, right? They have an issue, it's a chronic disease. So what we're trying to do with our ED providers, because you're trained, I treat acute disease, no. The majority of what you see is managing chronic disease, and it crosses all socioeconomic backgrounds, crosses physical, behavioral health, substance abuse. So we've actually developed um, what are called Sherpa programs, where it was before we used to hand out a piece of paper. Can you imagine that? We'd hand out a piece of paper to folks and say, you don't have an indication for admission, you're not in acute withdrawal, here's a list of places where you can go to get care. It's not appropriate. So we changed that. Now, we actually have a warm handoff from a peer coach in the emergency room that actually, if the patient engages, will actually navigate them like a Sherpa, similar challenge, right? Directly into acute detoxification and rehab. We've impacted over 100 lives that who knows how many could have been lost. If I see one more overdose death in the ED, it's far too many. So these are the things that we're trying to retrain our providers on the hospital side, and then on the primary care side, right? It shouldn't be that we're seeing a patient every six minutes. How could you do that in primary care? And why do we do that in primary care? Goes back to what Dr. Raju said. We have to incent primary care. We've got to change the way primary care providers are compensated so that there is better opportunity for them to build a comprehensive care plan for their patients. 
And it's the whole reason why we see specialist spend being was I have nothing against specialists. I love our specialists. They're incredible, especially pediatric cardiothoracic <laughs> surgeons. <laughs> but primary care is the focus. And so for our allied health professionals, they play a huge role, right? If you read, I don't, can't even remember what even version now we're into of healthy um, people, you know, 2010, 2020, same theme going on again, deja vu all over again. 50, 60,000 shortage of primary care providers. How are we gonna meet that need? Advanced practice professionals can help fill that gap. So for our NPs and our PAs and our nurses, you all are the backbone. So I wanna, so I'm gonna end there and um, I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to be with you this morning and I look forward to the panelist discussions next. Thank you. Just great. Our last speaker, uh, David Nimeroff, heads the uh, NASA Federally Qualified Health Systems. I asked him how many locations he has, um, and there are kind of multiple places. They count nine, they have probably 10, one school base, doing more. And it's really part of the essential part of the healthcare system in NASA, there's a counterpart in Suffolk that we don't see. There's no big buildings, There's this is community-based in a sense, but it's doing some vital, vital care, and it's been in a number of ways uh, fostered sporadically by the federal government. Um, hopefully it will continue to be fostered by the federal, the federal government uh, because it is an essential part of our healthcare system, but it's doing things in a different way. David. <laughs> So good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Dean. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, my, my panel. Uh, my son is here someplace. Sorry, I'm embarrassing you. So uh, <laughs> as a Hofstra student, again, my name is David Nemiroff. And I'm not a doctor, but I'm a social worker. And I run a medical facility. Uh, we'll get that in a second. Uh, a little about me. I joke with my staff and my son. I was born into this. My parents were house parents upstate New York in a residential treatment center for mentally ill women. And so I had 14 mentally ill sisters growing up. And uh, I literally never left. You know, I was born with it. My folks are both social workers, private practice, uh, intensive case managers, and so I was stuck to do this. It was just, you know, destiny, I guess. Um, and so in my career, uh, before joining the Long Island FQHC, I was uh, the head of the Mental Health Association of Nassau County. And I, I saw the need for the, the behavioral health, the mental health needs of our community. Uh, actually was on the board of the health center and, and uh, an opportunity came up for me to, to become the, its CEO. And we work with these awesome, monstrous organizations at the ground level, probably dealing with a slightly different population. And I'll get into what we are and what does that mean as an organization. But just so you know, right here in wealthy Nassau County, well, a mile away from here, there are people who struggle to put food on the table, as they said, a roof over their head. And we'll talk about that a little bit about what we are. And nationally, there are lots of people, even though there's this Affordable Care Act and there's all this Medicare and Medicaid, there are still people who don't have insurance today. And there are still people who struggle to, to, to make ends meet. So let's go through some of this. So what do we are? So we're a private nonprofit organization. So uh, we're comprised of, of a board of directors, mostly who are our patients. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about our history uh, because it's kind of interesting. We were once Nassau County Department of Health. So most of our facilities were county clinics. And the history goes, and the senator and others probably know it better than I, in 1999, the county said we're getting out of the business. And they created a public benefit corporation called Nassau Healthcare Corporation, which is comprised of Nassau University Medical Center, a big building kind of down the block, uh, A. Holly Patterson Nursing Home, and at the time, multiple uh, community clinics. Uh, so 10 years ago, they created this, this uh, public-private uh, partnership. Uh, excuse me, uh, that was in 1999. 10 years ago, the board of the hospital created us. They said, we're working with these folks out in the community. We're struggling to support the community. I think the CEO told me at the time that we don't answer the phone 95% of the time. I'm like, how do you know that? Um, and we have to do a better job. So they created, uh, 10 years ago, the Long Island Federally Qualified Health Center, not a very, you know, neat name, but that's what they called us. And um, they sought support from the federal government. And they reached out to the federal government and said, hey, can we, hey, can we do this? 
And we want to be what's called a public entity. It's really a weird thing because not a lot of public entities work with private entities to work with a community. And there's probably only a handful in the state. Now uh, Gotham Health, I think, in the city uh, does that with health and hospitals. And then uh, Denver Health is kind of was our uh, guiding star when we had done this. Um, so this was all before I had joined where the leadership said we have to do a better job working with these community members and working right at the, at the street level. And so that's how kind of we were created. Uh, ten years ago, actually this year is our ten year anniversary and we're, we're still here, thank goodness. A um, little brief, brief history. Um, so in the United States, this actually happened about 50 years ago. So I won't get into this whole slide, but basically civil rights activists said, you know what, we are not taking care of our poor. Um, you heard about all the different things with social determinants, which I'll talk about in a minute, but we weren't taking care of people who needed it. And so Dr. Geiger and others helped found the health center movement. And so it was then actually up in uh, Boston, I think in Missouri, where they first started this, where they created health centers. My staff and I actually went to East Boston um, a couple of months ago to see some of the initial stuff. And it was really just designed around community needs. What are we gonna do to help our community be healthy? And so that's kind of how we began. But FQHCs, federally qualified health centers, are dealing with, and I'll have some other slides, dealing with individuals in rural neighborhoods, on tribal grounds, all throughout the country. There is an FQHC in every state in the, uh, in the union. You've probably never heard of them. Oh, wow, my slide thing's up here. Um, oh, so here's a little blurb, if it's going to work, on what an FQHC is. Will it play? No, it didn't work. All right, so we'll move into this. Um, so federally qualified health centers throughout the country service about 29 million individuals. Most of those folks live in poverty. Uh, about 82% um, I think of them um, nationally uh, are get either uninsured or have some kind of public payment option. Here in Nassau, in our health center, we have 28% of our patients or 10,000 individuals in Nassau County who don't have any insurance. They play a sliding scale fee. Um, another high majority have Medicaid, Medicaid managed care, a lot of have, uh, children have CHIP child health insurance, um, and then a small, small percentage have uh, private insurance. But in America's health centers, you have to be located in a high need area. That's the federal government says you must be, you heard of food deserts, so we have to be in places where there's not a lot of them, and not a lot of uh, good primary care providers. Uh, and yes, that we should, primary care is definitely what's needed, so I appreciate that, Dr. Um, we have to offer a comprehensive set of services which may be, you know, so it's not just primary care for us. It has to be a little bit more than that. And we have to be open to everybody. Although it says federally qualified in our name, we do not ask you about your immigration status. And we cannot. And we hopefully will never have to do that. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, and and the, what's weird about us is our board of directors have to be the patients who use us. By federal law, 51% of my board members must be people who come to the health center, get a physical, get a service within the last year or else you can't be a board member. I'll take donations, they don't have it, but it's not about that. It's about they have to community direct the care. They live there. My board members from Roosevelt and Elmont and, and, and Hempstead tell me every day what I should and should not be doing because they live in the community. So it serves a lot of people throughout the country. Somebody once told me that half of all children born in this country are served in a federally qualified health center. You may not know it because nobody puts FQHC in their name, they call them Gotham Health, and they call them Hudson River Healthcare, and other things, but they are a community health centers. Um, you see, we have a huge impact on our patients' care. We sometimes deal with the most chronically ill individuals, because sometimes that's the, we're the only place they have to go. We're it. We're the last you know, uh, place for folks to go. Those you know, 10,000 individuals that come to me, their average payment to me is $25. That's it. That's not a copay. That's the payment because that's all they can afford. And it's based on the federal poverty guidelines. So they come to us based on their ability to pay. Um, and you'll see here, you know, we deal with, uh, there's again, 1,400 uh, health centers. And, and NAC, National Association of Community Health Centers, estimates that because of our low cost of care, we save the health system about $24 billion a year in costs that would go elsewhere. And the federal government's piece of this, and I joke, um, Dr. Rizzo, that the federal government pays mm -hmm. us the Northwell budget, meaning it's about $12 billion nationwide to take care of the country for community health centers. That's what every, the 29 million people, that's what health centers get. So just one health system's budget here in New York covers the entire United States of America. So we serve a lot of people for not a lot of dollars. <coughs> and those are grants that the federal government will put out at times. Uh, we get some grant funding. 
uh, most half of our budget act is actually comprised of grants because obviously the fees for service do not pay the bill. So what are some benefits of having a federally qualified health center right here in Nassau County? Um, again, we talk about price transparent, uh, ability to, to give services to anybody regardless of their ability to pay. Price transparency, you heard this on the news, it's a big deal, price transparency. Guess what I do? I put my prices on the wall when you walk in the door. You're going to know what you're going to pay. We actually have to, by federal regulation, list all the prices right then and there. It's a sliding fee scale. So if based on your income, you'll know what you got to pay. Uh, 340B, what is that? Well, that's a drug discount program where we can get either free or discounted drugs. We joke that it's like it's cheaper than the Department of Defense. We get it cheaper than Canada. That's a benefit of an FQHC. So we do have discounts that can be, you know, if somebody's paying $250 for med, we'll probably buy it for $20. And we give those discounts to our patients because if you can't take medication, what the heck's the point of coming to the doctor if we can't give you some of the tools? One unique feature from us that's different than our, our peers here at the table is we don't pay malpractice insurance for our providers. Federal government realizes we're in high need areas. That's a huge cost. They pick that up. So every one of our providers, OB providers, dentists, doctors, are all covered with the federal government. So that saves us probably a million dollars a year just in operating expense, which helps augment when those folks don't pay. Uh, we have some things for our doctors, National um, uh, Service Corps, which is a loan forgiveness program. So if you come to work for me, I may not be able to pay you as, as much as my peers, but you can get $50,000 a year if you apply in tuition reimbursement. That'll be paid, uh, taken off your student uh, bills for three, up to three years. It helps. I still can't compete with those salaries, but it helps. Um, we, have to have, we have to, by regulation, have care management services. Uh, we actually did, went one further where we, uh, a couple of years ago, embarked and, and worked with the uh, health home in New York State to work with chronically ill individuals. And so we serve, I've got Melinda and Stan here, we're, and Julie, we're, we uh, provide services to about 1,000 people, adults and children, who are chronically ill. So that means they have two or more chronic conditions. And so we'll go out to their home to look at the social issues to try to work on addressing them. And that's been a huge, huge godsend for us. We're also working, I think, with Northwell, their health, health home recently in that. So. The goal for us is to find out what's going on, what's causing you to go to the hospital, what's causing you to have to need all of our services, and what can we do to help on the social determinant side. So we'll go right into your house, see if we can help. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. In every one of our sites, we have a food pantry. So in a health center, we'll give you food. Similar to Northwest Hospitals, we do that, and, and similar to the uh, other stuff there, we, uh, we will do that because nine times out of 10, somebody says, I'm hungry. And actually, Dr. Jack Geiger, who started this, that was his first script he wrote. And the federal government said, well, what the heck are you doing? You're, that's, a, that's not a drug. And he goes, well, malnutrition. Isn't that what we do? We give food when people are hungry. So that's kind of how the health center movement was started. Um, and we have to, and actually our employees, we try to hire people that look and sound just like our folks. And we did, we did a demographic study. We are almost within a percentage point of our employees to our, uh, our uh, patients we serve. So from the different languages, different cultural backgrounds, we try to match up so as culturally competent as we can without 15 minute slides, we actually hire somebody from that culture. <laughs> Tries to make it a little bit easier because they already know it coming in. Um, so here's just some of our services, which you know, you're like, well, what, we're, we're a doctor's office. We're not uh, Go Health. We're not um, um, some of the, the nice um, Urgy centers, but we're a doctor's office. We're not a clinic where you're going to take a number and, and see the next guy up. You're going to see your primary care provider. You're going to come for and see an internal medicine. We have OBGYN in all of our sites. So, and we give birth to a lot, a lot of babies. Uh, family medicine providers. We even have a, a teaching health center program where we train uh, 21 residents uh, in our, our centers to be doctors. Um, dental is in four of our locations. And anybody on Medicaid or uninsured try to find a dentist? It's not so easy. So if you have a sliding fee scale and you can access dental care, it's huge. And, and the weight is, is huge. We're trying to expand that service. And mental health services. We, over the last couple of years, uh, since my involvement six years ago, have added behavioral health to every one of our health centers. So there's psychiatry, social work in every health center because you know there's no, you know, you have to have that connection to physical health and mental health. You know, I had something as simple as a blew, blown out knee uh, 20 years ago. I was depressed. Imagine not having a roof over my head or having food in my belly. That's, and that's just one. And a lot of it is about the economic stressors, but we have very, some serious uh, mental illness uh, individuals we deal with as well. And then a whole bunch of ancillary services in some of the sites. Nutrition, um, podiatry, radiology, cardiology, uh, neurology. These are very limited services in some cases. Optometry. But some of our folks can't find specialty care. 
we struggle with things like an endocrinologist because we work with National University Medical Center and they've got two. And it's just, it could be a 120 day wait. It's not their fault, they just don't have the providers. And so who wants to take somebody with nothing? And by the federal government rules, if I have a referral agreement with a provider, that provider has to accept a sliding fee scale because we can't have our patients being taken advantage of. And see, so how do you know, you know, these are just some of the things that are out there in, in the, the world that we deal with as an organization. We provide ID cards for people because sometimes if they're uh, not a citizen, they don't have an ID card. And that's some of the, the only ID they have in this country. We actually, for those folks eligible for health insurance, we'll have a health insurance company in the health center enrolling them in health insurance, excuse me. And, and with National University Medical Center, they have a big mammography van that'll come to the sites to do some work there. We also take care of that social determinant in terms of food, WIC for new moms, um, the Women's Infant Children Supplemental Nutrition Program. We got about 5,100 families that are served in three of our health centers. So we co-locate a WIC site within the health center. And this was not my doing. The county was actually smart enough. They did this years ago. It was, both of them were run by Nassau County. And so we applied for a grant a couple of years ago and won the grant. So we co-locate uh, Yadi, our directors here, where both of those services are connected because you have to have health and you have to have food, you know, little things. There's a theme here. Um, and unfortunately, with some of the political challenges, that's been more and more of a challenge with people staying enrolled in WIC. And we talked earlier about care management. So for us, care management's people, not, a, not necessarily a phone call or a flyer, but people going to somebody's home, interacting with you, helping to address the social issue. And Melinda will tell me the biggest thing is typically housing. Here we have, uh, here's just a picture. Uh, Senator Hannon listed some of the, the sites we have. We are actually in development for two new school-based health centers because if we catch it young and we can work with kids in school and provide the script and have it mailed to them, uh, their you know, medicine mailed at home, by the time they get home from school, that's gonna help a family who's struggling and mom who may, or dad may be working two jobs. And because every child, regardless of immigration status, is eligible for Child Health Plus, no child should be uninsured in New York State. No, it doesn't matter if you're an immigrant or not. And so we should be, we wanna work with these schools. We provide a NP, a nurse, nurse practitioner, and a social worker to work on the behavioral health and the medical in some of these high need areas. Here's just a little snapshot of who we served last year. So it was about 33,000 patients in the health center alone. 5,000 were in WIC and another 1,000 in, um, in care management. But we did this with over 150,000 encounters that walked through the door right here in Nassau County. So we're not a big, huge system, but still we had 150,000 visits that came through our, our doors, and this is all shapes and sizes of people. So what does this have to do with social determinants of health? Well, we, as, said, as everybody else has said, it's, we're also trying to intersect and interact with the physical health with those social issues. We have what's called a community health advocate in every one of our health centers that deals with an individual. If you don't have insurance, they'll help navigate you someplace. If you are chronically ill, they'll refer you to, over to our care management program and we'll give you somebody, a live person to work with you. We, we work on these social and economic factors. I'm not gonna go through the slide because both of the gentlemen before me did a great job of, of doing that. But what do we do also? How do we know? So like the other systems, we ask, and now we have structured data that shows, we ask, this, this is a national t tool used by health centers called the PREPARE tool. And so this PREPARE tool uh, works to help us un find the underlying challenges that individuals are having in their social determinants. This is part of our clinical record now, and we can use the data from this to then you know, make improvements. Here's just a brief, brief sample of, this is a report uh, from about two weeks ago, and I pulled it up again yesterday, and it's already changed, of just the sample pilot of what our patients are saying is their stressor. What are their social issues? Mm -hmm. so, so it's just interesting that language, because most of our folks, you know, we have, that don't speak the language to get around is hard. You know, insurance, they don't have insurance. Unemployment or underemployment right here, uh, you know, in a, in a low unemployment environment is a problem for our patients. And it was mentioned before about the economics. If you don't have any money, it's kind of hard to, to take care of yourself. Um, these are just some of the uh, lack of transportation, some healthy food. So this, these numbers have already changed in the, in the two weeks because we ask this every day. And we serve about, I'd say, five, 600 visits a day through the health centers. So they're asking this on a, on a daily basis. So I thought it was just really, really interesting. But what do we do as an organization to address, you know, these social determinants? And I'm gonna go through that. But we do all kinds of funky things that we can do that's gonna help our patients in any way, shape, or form. We have what Senator Hannon called, we have value-based payment contracts. So we do get some reimbursement if we keep people healthy um, for those folks who have Medicaid managed care. So Julie and the team over there, we've instituted Uber Health. So what is that? 
well, if you don't come to us, you can't get there. The bus doesn't work so hot. We got to get you to, to us because, you know, you're chronically ill and you need to see your doctor. And we learned for a small pilot with United Healthcare that three individuals have like a dozens of hospitalizations over a six month period. And we started working with them. One gentleman would hang out at LIJ all the time because he loved going there on Wednesdays for food. You guys served something really great over there. I don't know what it was. So, so he, it was, it was, if you ever see that movie, uh, TV show Cheers, Norm, they just, he just came in. It was great. Everybody loved him. He had a great time. We kind of talked to him about, you know, maybe you don't need to go to the hospital. And, and we had to kind of reconfigure uh, his social uh, scene, and we paid for Uber Health to bring him to us and talk and meet with a social worker. And, you know, and, and after the three months with pilot was over, of course, nobody went to the hospital because we did a good job. We had things like, you know, trying to deal with people who were um, deaf, and it said in our EMR to, you know, give them a call. Well, that didn't really work. S but we have to do things that are, um, I think I had a social work professor once said, start where the patient's at, right? So if you can't get someplace, it's really hard. So Uber Health is there to help us a little bit. Metro cards, because for those folks who can, you know, just get a, a Metro card. It's a couple bucks, but a Metro card just to get to, and all our sites are by public transportation. Um, I talked about food, a farmer's market in the summertime. Uh, we hosted our Roosevelt site, a farmer's market every Sunday. And then they can use the WIC cards. Uh, women can use WICSIS, I think, is the new thing, or NIWIC. I always screw that up and Yadi yells at me. But they can use the cards to get uh, fruits and vegetables that are locally sourced. They come from out east, and we bring them there. Uh, we have a, a group bringing them there. Um, we do you know, cooking demonstrations. So how do you cook? How do you cook that's, that's less costly? We got a grant to bring in a chef to show people how to do that. Because, you know, what is it, teaching how to fish? You know? So turkey giveaways. We had once, it was, this was, I was so embarrassed. We, a couple of years ago, gave a turkey away to a family and all the, the fixings and this and that. And the, the woman was late with her kids and, and like, you know, what happened? I was getting all cranky and pissy, you know, I got things to do. She had to take like two buses to get there and it took like her two hours and I was like, oh, okay. I'm just... So of course we got the van and we made sure her and the kids, we took her home and we learned for next time, if we have that issue again, we're gonna ask that you need help and we'll help get you there because we didn't do a good job there. But to even to give away a turkey, no good deed goes unpunished. So we do what we think our community needs because all those things matter and they're nothing to do with how great my medical staff are. Um, my medical staff are awesome, and I would put us up against anybody, but there's a lot more to it than we've heard about today. Toy drives, coat giveaways, um, you know, uh, baby showers for new moms. Something as simple as giving them, you know, the tools. And then what scares me a lot is we've got a grant for a mobile coach. So we're gonna be going out in the community, mostly to Department of Social Services, to probably homeless shelters, because folks really have a hard time getting to us and so we'll have a mobile coach that'll hopefully go into effect next year to, to help improve that access. And, and we collaborate a lot with folks. Uh, this is just some, um, but our outreach, uh, Julie, our VP of Pop Health here and others, do a couple hundred outreach events a year for a small little organization here in Nassau, and because it takes a village. When you're talking about social determinants, these systems are amazing. They have awesome tools, and I would, I've taken my child to both of them. They are amazing systems. But sometimes people just need a little hand a little discussion, a little support, a stipend to help cover the rent maybe. Maybe they need access to you know, a safe place. So yes, we can community center. It will refer folks over to, or, or in, in Hempstead, um, they need uh, ling English language courses. So we'll get them over there uh, with George and his crew. Lance over here with uh, EAC to Meals on Wheels, because you know, again, the theme of food. Um, even working with Island Harvest and, and Long Island Cares, they'll give us the food. How do we get it? Because all that makes a difference. Uh, and we know from, from some of the medical stuff, if have people have a healthier diet, we're working with God's Love We Deliver to hopefully do a pilot on medically tailored meals for some of our chronically ill individuals. Because if you're eating healthy, it's, help, it's really helpful. And you've heard both gentlemen before me, me talk about that. Um, here's just a little blurb about where our sites are. We do have a site on the Belmont Racetrack. So you think, well, what's so big deal about that? Well, for those folks who may not be aware, we have, it's almost like another country right here in Nassau County, there are about two to 4,000 workers on the Belmont racetrack, and about 85% of those are uninsured. And they're paid for by the horse owners and trainers, and they fund a health clinic. So we have a federally qualified health center on a racetrack uh, serving those workers, small two-room shop, uh, but they can't even, we have a site across the street, but they can't come to us across the street because they gotta work, and they gotta walk the horses and, thing, and things like that, so we provide that care right there on site for those Belmont uh, workers. And so we, you'll see where we are located is where what the federal government says are high need areas. 
and then we've grown uh, a little bit when we've had some conversations with school districts. So I just want to thank you guys for a few minutes about uh, what we can do, and we have done, and we've partnered with these folks, and it's, it's really important to focus and flip this, uh, I think, um, revenue curve, or, or cost curve, excuse me, to focus on these social issues, because if we do that, I think it'll reduce the disease management and all the other things that uh, both of my colleagues here talked about today. Thank you. Thank you, David. I, um, I didn't realize you were called the Long Island FQHC because I do know there's a whole FQHC system in Suffolk. So, That's where we're held here. Yes, I, but it was the ambition of the uh, board at uh, NUMC that named you uh, yes. in 1999. But it was also a struggle because you did some interesting things creating the majority of your board out of the community. Think if you just started out and you didn't have anyone on the board, how do you say to somebody who's a little bit below the poverty level, oh, would you like to serve on a board providing health care? So it's, you've come a long way. There's some questions, and Tony, are you going to get, collect some questions and all that and bring them up? But I have one question to start off with, and I was, I wanted to get into a little more of the metrics, and, and uh, Dr. Zhu, you mentioned this with your 15 questions, and instead of just asking about how would you do the measurement, David's hired a social worker, um, I, I want to pose it in a different way. Now, I can't deal with the legislature for another, oh, I don't know, 14 months, because I have a two-year a cooling off period once I left the legislature. But presuming I could, well, that's what the law is. <laughs> and this year, believe me, I was happy to not to. Um, but presuming I could, and suppose I was going up to the legislature and I would say to them, I have a package, a program that's going to be applicable to every healthcare system. And it's going to be called social determinants metrics. And we will fund it if you can show us how you're going to either save money or B, improve health, or hopefully both at once, if you would tell us how you're going to determine who should get a food program, who should get a transportation program, who might need a very short-term uh, housing intervention program. And so that's my general question. Now, catching you all off guard, because I should have told you this before, but it only hit me as you were speaking. I'll ask you in sequence what, what your response to that would be. You know, this is a, a, a big topic which is going on. In fact, uh, I will be testifying before Congress next month, next week, regarding how to metrics, how do you measure this as a part of it, because that's what exactly the question they want to know. If I'm going to pay you, how do I know you do the good job or not? The first part of it is, as I said, what we should not do. We should not make the same mistake we made in the quality, right? Quality metrics are all about how well the doctor does. It's never about how well the patient got. So even the outcomes we determine are not the patient outcome. It's the doctor directed, I, I thought this is a good outcome for you, right? That's, that's the way it is. So it has got to be absolutely patient-driven outcomes to start with. The metrics are basic. This is a, the social determinant is a tough one because it depends on the geography plays a big important part, right? If I'm in New York City, a major problem in New York City is a, is a housing, is a major issue, right? But if I go to Iowa, the major issue is your transportation. If I go to Alabama, the major issue is social isolation. So I have different things. So what we need to do is like we collect the, what we call as a community health indices we need to collect some community social indices, which is already done. Robert Wood Johnson publishes every year how the various things are, food, how food insecurity, how about transportation, how public safety, how about the, the, the economic opportunity. All those things are there. So hospitals should choose saying that, okay, I live in the zip code and the major social determinant in the zip code is this. And I am going to work on my patient to bring that down. For example, let's say that Northwell says a major problem, 12% of Northwell's patients are in the food deserts. If Northwell applies for a metric, it should say, okay, I'm going to really work on the food deserts. I'm going to put all my community dollars into that. I'm going to take all the health fairs and the everything, the balloons, and put it into the, into the you know, food, food insecurity. In two years, I'm going to show you from 12% food 
desert, it comes to 10%. And that should be the way we should be able to do that. And as we are creating social vulnerability index, we are, we are one for the patients on the 15 question. We also one for the communities based on various data. For example, Department of Agriculture puts the data on food insecurity. The, the, uh, the cops put the data on the public safety. Transportation department find out how, how long does it take to transport people, right? So we have various social data available, but nobody brought them all together. And that's what we are doing. We're bringing everything together and say, Zip code this, this is your major problem, three problems, okay? If you choose one and decide to solve it, then if you solve it, go to the next one. So it is a very focused way of doing that. So that should be the metric to create that. Metric cannot, it cannot you cannot measure a hospital like a system like Northwell or, or NYU or whatever it is, how well we do in community cannot, the measurement cannot be how much of money we spent. That's what we are doing now. The community benefit dollars, how much you spend? Oh, I spent $12 million. Oh, I spent 14. I'm a better community guy because I spend more money. It is not about the money. What do you do with that, right? That's, that should be the measurement. So the measurement should be patient-focused outcome, not the physician-based outcome or, or system-based outcome. Two, it cannot be about how well we did, right, how well they got. It doesn't matter. I can throw uh, aspirin at a patient with a you know, MI or a heart attack, and I can get the credit. I can say, OK, I'm a good system. I'm a good quality, because I gave you aspirin. No one say, what happened to the patient? Right? That's the issue. So we have to really do that differently. But this is a big discussion which is going on across the nation. The problem we are going to have is we are not going to have one metric. The metric is going to depend on the various geographic locations and what is the most prevalent problem in that area, and then be able to deal with it. All right, thank you. Yeah, Patrick. I, I, I'll add to, to what Ram shared, and I would implore you and other policy makers to please not necessarily adopt the same strategy we did with quality. And what I mean by that is we need to develop measures that matter. We are over-measuring. We are measuring far too many things, many of which do not necessarily impact overall outcomes of care. Furthermore, we see a schizophrenia between the federal level and the state level. And you, am I right or am I wrong? Right. Look at sepsis. Yes. It's a nightmare. So, you know, we're chasing tons and tons of indicators. And what we want is we want to impact outcomes of care. So I agree with uh, Dr. Raju. I think there are key pillars um, that span the entire uh, domain of social determinants. And I think from a healthcare perspective, we should focus on developing um, measures that we have an opportunity to either screen and catch or impact. So food insecurity, literacy, access to care, and then uh, around medication management, and access to medications. I think those would be important. But I would just say uh, we need to get a panel of the right thought leaders together to develop a set that creates a degree of standardization while at the same time allows flexibility by zip code. David? Thank you. Um, so we're in a nice country, very wealthy, probably the wealthiest in the, in the world. Other countries have figured some of this stuff out. You know, we're not the healthiest country for all the $3 trillion in this stuff right now that we spend. So there are ways to measure social determinants. Uh, we talked with uh, one of our biggest payers, and United Healthcare, about housing. So they're doing a housing project where they're taking our 10 chronically ill people who cost more than $100,000 a year and kind of giving them housing. Because they know if they have a house, they're going to be healthier. And they said in other states, they've saved a gazillion dollars on it because that's what the people needed. So I assume that if we looked at other countries throughout the, the world, they focused on and found some value in some of those social determinants. And we, like they said, we can't beat it up. Uh, Dr. Ward is here who worked with me at National University Medical Center in the past and always yelled at me, you know, claims and quality is not a very good way to measure things. And so we kind of bastardized that in the system today. But there are indexes of how people feel, outcomes that they're achieving. We can look at school graduation rates. We can look at those food deserts. There's definitely ways to measure this. And there's definitely ways to get better outcomes for the same dollars we're spending. Thank you. Got some questions here. Um, I get to editorialize by picking which one goes first. Um, but they're all important. Thank you. The, um, the, we, we have, you're all aware of the DISHRIP uh, 
program, and you're all aware that it's supposedly coming to an end, and you're all aware that the state is going, has in the course of uh, uh, pre pre preparing and pr provided some uh, comment uh, documents, uh, going to apply to the federal government to uh, continue it. The question is, how impactful has DISHRIP been in helping you address social determinants? And how concerned are you that once DISHRIP 1 is over, will, will we lose ground? So I know all of you have been involved with DISHRIP, um, so I thought that would be a good first question. David, let me let you go first since you had the most uh, involvement. Sure. So in, uh, in uh, early in district years, I was able to have the honor of running the local PPS here, Nassau Queens PPS, while running the health center. And um, first and foremost, we as an organization did a lot as uh, NQP. And also we, uh, the, the Long Island FQHC, had done a lot. And district really helped what I thought was improve relationships. Um, I'm sitting here with North Long CHS, and I was at the table with these gentlemen and their counterparts for years planning, uh, and we got together and actually invested some dollars in the community. If you're a community provider, you say we didn't get enough. And I agree that more should have been invested in the community, but relationships were founded. We started a lot of our food pantry stuff during that. Our care management started uh, during district. Our community health advocates were a direct <coughs> outcropping of district dollars, where we did these PAM surveys to find out how activated people were with their health care. Um, our bedside, we now go bedside. So when one of our patients winds up in a hospital, we go to them in the hospital, make sure they come back to us. All that was related to district work and all the connections with our community-based providers that have improved over the years was because of district work. I do fear because of politics that it may not uh, get approved in its current form, but I, and I think it should be tweaked in the future. Uh, as much as a lot of work happened with big systems, I think we need to put a little bit more of those dollars down to the community-based organizations, health and welfare councils in the room, uh, local providers, and local social uh, service organizations, because I think that will help move the needle on the disease stake more in the next iteration of District 2.0. So I'm hopeful that when comments are done that, and the state submits to the federal government, that we can kind of focus it on the next iteration of improving those relationships that started and then getting maybe some of the things you would ask in the first question, some of the good data about social determinants through District 2.0 and the outcomes that it achieves. Patrick? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I uh, would agree with, with my colleague. I think District has had a major impact uh, in the communities that we serve. And, and I'll tell you, um, one of the measures um, near and dear to me as an ED provider was really uh, the overall outcome measures was an overall reduction plan of 25% of ED admissions over the five years. And that's a proxy uh, as a capture failure rate, right? Because if people are utilizing the ED uh, for their primary source of care, then we fail them from an access standpoint. So when you speak with uh, you know, Peggy Chan and others at the Medicaid redesign team, and you look at the overall data of how DISRIP has performed, um, it's performed favorably. We've reduced ED utilization. We've expanded access to care, and, and we should, of course, I think further expand uh, dollars and community access programs, but it's it's a, it's really been a mechanism to help healthcare systems think differently on at how we intersect and interact with community-based organizations and how we then realize and influence the social determinants around behavioral health, access to care, um, food insecurity. We also you know launch fresh food pharmacy uh, with an F, not a PH, right? Uh, and, and then expanded new clinics, new access to care. We've seen ED utilization drop. We've seen health outcomes improve. My biggest concern is while all these pathways are being developed, that the connective tissue is not yet formed. So, it, you know, this, the saying in quality, right, it takes a village, this takes multiple villages. It's really been a privilege to work uh, with our colleagues at. Uh, the neighboring health systems, because we all share the same goals. Uh, we want to improve the health of the population. We want to expand access to care. We want to um, really uh, have an impact on the communities we serve, and DISRIP has allowed that. So I do think there is merit to continuing, although the, the program will evolve, uh, continuing the program I think is vital. I do fear that if for uh, whatever reason 
uh, they decide not to fund District 2, you'll begin to see a decay, unfortunately. These things take years to build infrastructure and build security. We have a whole population health division. So many of these talented folks are here with me today on my team. Uh, they're here. These are the folks that are changing the way care is delivered. We wouldn't have that opportunity uh, without the program. Dr. Amu, you, you have um, several PPSs in, in your service territory. So I think uh, I agree with both David and Patrick. Uh, it, this uh, actually opened the eyes of majority of the healthcare organization that there is a community-based organizations. They will do a good job, and you need to understand and work with them. So that is the first thing. And the second thing is the social determinants conversation, which was going nowhere in the first decade of this century suddenly got a prominence because of the district. Otherwise, nobody would even talk about this thing. So that's a great part. But going forward, we have to really change the way district. District was, you know, in a, I'm not cynical, but in a way, it basically said how to keep the sick patient out of the hospital. That was a metric, right? Metric is you're a sick person, keep them out of the hospital. Right? Do anything possible, keep them out of the hospital to make the metric. It is not about how to make the patient healthier. That's a bigger conversation. So as we go into the district, we have to really figure out, it's not just keep the people out of the hospital. It is how to keep them healthy, right? I think hopefully the district 2.0 comes in, we will be a little bit more yeah. knowledgeable and a little more, a bit more you know, smarter in really defining what the metric is. The metric cannot be keep people out of the hospital. Right, 25% reduction in the inpatient side, then people figure out how to keep them out. Right? They keep them observation, they keep them out somewhere, and they, they admit them into other places, I send them home with a bed, whatever we do. right? All these things are management of sick patients outside the hospital, but we have to cross a Rubicon and say, how do you keep the patient healthy in the first place? So I think it's a good idea, but hopefully we have an opportunity. If we get an opportunity, we need to do it a little differently. The, uh, the next question really uh, is an interesting facet, takes us into another dimension of healthcare, but directly impacts on social determinants. The questioner says, what are your recommendations on how to get physicians to buy into and practice patient engagements? Um, what matters to you? What barriers exist to achieving this? So. Yeah, sure. I think uh, the physicians are uh, extremely overworked at the present time, right? Uh, because we have the productivity-based system right now in, in healthcare. You have to see X number of patients because that's paid for numbers, right? If you see. So if you don't do the productive measure, it kind of reduces the number of minutes you involve with the patient. During the time, you have to do a lot of things, especially primary care. They have to do a lot of stuff over a period of time. So the physicians are getting burnt out very quickly, and they're saying, look, I cannot do that. I mean, when I mean physician, I don't mean physician, providers, you know, PAs, nurse practitioners, every one of them getting burnt up. So the question would be, the measurement of the physician right now is based on a quality metric or the numbers. You are a successful guy, we advertise. I have the most successful cardiologist in my system because he did 1,000 cardiac stents last year. That's not something to celebrate. That means this guy failed 1,000 people. Right, and killed them, and brought them into the cardiac extent as a part of it. We have to be a little bit more, we can't celebrate sickness, right? So I think what we have to do is we have to give the physicians a different metrics and saying that you are, I'm going to say you are a good doctor, are you getting a five star, or you're going to be appearing in the New York's uh, 100 best doctors, because you really take care of the holistic care of the patient as a, as a part of it. So I think that that movement is coming in. In fact, after uh, uh, dealing with the US News and World Report for the last seven years, is Brian saying that why you keep, every year you publish this, this, this issue saying which is the best cardiac hospital, which is our, it's all sick care. Why can't you have an issue saying which is the most community-based, healthy hospital system in the country, right? People didn't want to do that, but now, Next year, they're going to come out with that. So we are having the first meeting in November trying to figure out how do we calculate the metrics you talked about. So we will be coming out of US News and World Report to come out with these are the five best hospitals, right, which does a, keep, keep people, people healthy, right, as a part of it. Once that changes, physicians will be interested in doing what needs to be done. At the present time, people say, look, you want me to do everything at the end of it. You want to see patients 20 minutes in and out. 
At the end of it, you need a prescription. I need to educate the patient on my medications. I have to give them the, va the flu vaccine. I got to ask them diabetic education. I do everything. And also, you tell me now, please ask them, do you have a home to go to? Right? Come on, I only have 20 <coughs> minutes. What do you expect me to do? Right? So we have to be realistic in that. So we need to create systems around them. For a long time, the healthcare has become not an individual sport. It's a team sport. So we should be able to hand this over to different people so we work as a team with equal importance to all these things as part of it. Then you'll be able to do that. At the present time, if we just add one more social determinants on top of the heavy thing, it, it, it'll, it'll crumble. So this is a really, um, this is a complex issue and it's complex on many different levels. I would agree with my colleague, Dr. Raju. I think we have to redesign the way we compensate primary care providers, uh, in, and ideally all providers. But let's start with an unpacked primary care, right, which is foundational. Um, traditionally, it's a fee-for-service still model, right, or what's termed eat what you kill. You do more, you get paid more. So we've taken a strong initiative to revamp the way we pay our primary care providers. We pay for uh, panel size. We want them to expand their practice, expand hours on-demand access, spending the proper time with patients and not see a patient every uh, 8 to 12 minutes uh, to make what's called relative value unit or payment uh, numbers relative to contract. And we have to invest in that as, as a health system. We have to realize that that's the base. That's where it all starts. We want to leverage advanced practice providers, right? 30% of patients that come into a doctor's office, they may not even need to see a physician. So as the population ages and we have more polychronics, we have to be able to differentiate patients that do come into a practice that actually do need to see the physician versus who could see an incredibly well-qualified nurse practitioner or physician assistant and get great care. We have to then think about health coaches and care navigators because care is always going to be episodic in the office. But how about like my mom and dad who are in Florida, I have them plugged in with a health coach. They call home and say, hi, Mr. O, Mrs. O, how are you doing today? Are you short of breath? Did you take your medication? What you got in the refrigerator? Because they won't come up here. I tell them, come up here, stay with me, mom and dad, but they won't, they want to stay independent. So many people are like that. That's what we have to really focus on changing. Let's take it one step further upstream. What is the specialty that least, the least amount of graduates from US medical schools will go into? Primary care. Why? Because the average student comes out two hundred to four hundred thousand dollars in debt, and what do we pay our primary care providers? And I include in that bucket our pediatricians, our family practitioners, our internal medicine doctors, and even our OBGYN docs. We have to change the way we incent. So the programs that David mentioned around tuition forgiveness or loan forgiveness, very very important too. David. So we're we're struggling. Uh, I'll admit to you, we struggle at the health center. So when you have $25 a visit, it's kind of hard to remunerate your providers. Um, so we also, when we hire a provider, it's definitely got to be a mission-driven provider. But we try. So because we are still in this fee-for-service world and trying to break into this value-based world, so for next year, we're going to try to do a thing where we can get earned quality dollars based on uh, outcomes we make with our uh, insurance companies. And so there's probably millions of dollars that we haven't been able to access because of the, the challenge with that. And so we're kind of working with our providers and now our line staff to incentivize everybody towards quality where we said, look, we earn it. We're going to give 50% of it away to the staff and the docs because you do it. And we're going to try to put in those other systems, those community health advocates, those other things, social supports to boost everybody up. But on a day-to-day -day root cause, it's hard for us to compete with the Northwell or CHS. They're just awesome, amazing systems. And we really try to use all those other things like the um, health insurance, uh, the, excuse me, the, the loan forgiveness, uh, to t tell them, hey, the federal government's got your back because in my six years, I think we've had one claim and that kind of didn't happen because when somebody sees you suing the Attorney General of the United States, that kind of goes away. So <laughs> that's kind of a cool thing. Um, so we have other ways to kind of incentivize and support our primary care providers, but I don't pay them enough. I, they all need 30% more money. And I lose them sometimes. Um, I was telling, I think, uh, somebody earlier, we train 21 family medicine uh, residents every year, and then they seven of them every year graduate. And we try to retain them. And then when I see what I can offer them, and then they go out in the world and see what they can get at a Northwell CHS, Go Health, or what have you, I can't compete. Um, so it's hard. 
Um, you know, fortunately, uh, we've, we've been able to do it. We've got some folks who are been out in other state centers and come back to the community because they, they live in our community, so they want to serve that community. Sometimes we get folks part-time because they want to give a little bit of their hours. But incentivizing primary care in a family, federally qualified health center, it's, it's, it's been a challenge. We probably don't, we're getting better. We've increased salaries over time, but we're probably 20 to 30% under uh, the remuneration of our, our counterparts. And um, we do whatever we can to incentivize our folks. Thank you. Um, another facet of having, how to look at uh, social determinants, quote, do you think hotspotting would be a good way to help identify specific social determinants in certain communities? Now, hotspotting, I presume, by whoever wrote this, means the uh, prevalence of one type of condition or, or whatever over the other. Um, and would that be uh, useful? David, you're in the... Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, for us, our sites are hotspotted, first of all. We look at census tract data, uh, and actually I worked with Northwell recently to look at other sites. Where, so we looked at them and said, where are the most Medicaid lives, the avoidable uh, ED admissions, and behavioral health issues in throughout Nassau County that would be appropriate for even us to site a new location. So we hotspot there for location. Then we have with our population health team, we're always hotspotting because I've got you know, 40,000 patients. I can't give 40,000 patients what they need. I just don't have the manpower. I have 300 staff. I would need 300,000 staff to deal with, with what they, they really need. So we do hotspot. Who are the most chronically ill? Where are we seeing some of the, what are their zip codes? What are the issues around that? What collaborations could we build in a community because we're struggling with that? So when we're in a school district, we're seeing what's going on in that community that we can work with because we know that if we get invested in the local churches, the senior centers, the, the food pantries, others, we can then as a group you know, focus on that community. So we hotspot all over the place. Not as probably as detailed as the gentleman next to me. They have really awesome tools and they let us borrow them. So uh, <laughs> they, they're good. But you have to because it's, it's I guess, it's similar to like an ED, it's triage. We have to deal with what we can uh, you know, have the resources for. We don't have the resources to deal with everybody. So we try to take care of that 20% that that's probably costing all of us that 80% of our time. Um. Kind of a general question to end, uh, I think, our, our productive morning here. Uh, the question is, what is one way your organization is correcting or integrating environmental sustainability to the healthcare mission? Uh, sufficiently vague, but sufficiently, Im <laughs> sufficiently important, uh, because, <laughs> don't be sorry, that's the whole idea is to try to push the barriers of where we are and where we're going, and that's, so I don't, I don't know, um, Dr. I mean, for us, just little things. We're trying to put solar power on one of our buildings. We're LED uh, in, in every one of our facilities to make them more environmentally friendly. Um, but uh, I will tell you, it's not the most. It's not the thing we look at the, the, the most predominantly. Is, is the environmental impact? Um, all we try uh, to, to make everything as healthy as possible. Uh, I drive a Prius, but that's not here, there, there, here, here or there. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's something to probably think about for the future. So, um, eliminating waste is key to delivering value. And um, we need to be stewards of the planet. I'm a huge believer in that. Um, and I think there's a lot more all of us can do. But we're, we're trying to bend our impact on the environment. We're developing green spaces in our hospitals, in our offices. We're very cognizant of, it used to drive me nuts, I'd come home at night and I would see some of our office buildings, you know, by the time you get home it's eight, nine o'clock, and all the lights are on, and there's no one there. Uh, so really having smart devices put in to really, you know, how could we better conserve power. And then on the clinical side, um, your minds would be blown if you knew the amount of waste that occurs in healthcare. What do I mean by that? Well, I'll give you an example. Uh, and my colleague will, will share, I'm sure, similar stories from the operating rooms. You know, how many times you go into an operating room and the teams would just open up and prep for every type of contingency. All these products would be opened up and put on the tray. Let's open the pack, open the pack, get it all ready. Well, how about being and it's something called you know, radar, being forward thinking. And you know, there's a I'm also a pilot, there's a saying, stay ahead of the airplane, right? Stay ahead of the patient. What, are they, what do you think they're gonna need? Have it ready, but maybe don't break the sterile seal. Do you know how much gets wasted 
in terms of healthcare supplies, guess where that winds up? Winds up either being reprocessed or in landfills, et cetera. So we've really taken account, and we've involved our surgeons on that and our anesthesiologists. How do we be more mindful of what we're using on our patients? And that's not to say we're skimping. We have everything set up. But if we don't need to open it, don't. Have it ready, but be mindful of that. So we're trying to reduce the overall burden of waste and lean out to our facilities. I think I, I, I agree with both my colleagues. Uh, I think one of the major issues is that we have to understand that the environment affects the health to a great extent. In fact, I talked about the asthma yes. with, uh, with you, know, you cannot really create that part, part without doing that. So it has to be uh, environmental issues. It has to be a part of health in the, in the country. People need to do that. Apart from doing all the energy saving and all the things we do, we also have to take the environment into consideration as we, as a social issue, when we are able to do that. So the, to do that, we have to really be, uh, you know, proactive in that. I think we have to lead that that particular the environmental changes to uh, to a great extent. Uh, the, the medical industry or the healthcare industry has not really taken a very serious role in the environment, right, in in this country. The first part of it, I want to beg you to say, do not call it climate control. That is like a, that's really a kind of word we use just to, it is global warming. We're all going to be sunk under the water very, very soon. <laughs> there will not be lower tip of Manhattan. It is going to be gone. That's what it is, it's not climate control. It's like a, something like a thermostat, you control it, right? So <laughs> let's, let's take a, pro sometimes the words matter. It makes a big difference. I think we kind of, you know, choose to adapt some words which makes it not as bad. You know, you said climate, you know, changes we are really doing. It's not a climate change. It's a global warming. The earth is getting hotter. It's, that's a fact, right? So I think we have to really lead this, this, this movement to a greater level. It cannot be just having some, you know, some environmental leading that. It has got to be led by the healthcare and the health leaders and the people who work in healthcare because <coughs> the environment is directly, you know, control your health. So make sure. So that has to be a part of that. I would put that in this education for my for my medical students. I would teach them as a part of their residency program. I'll teach them as a part of the intake questions. Where do you live? What is the problem? When was the last time? You know, what is the lead level in there? Because we have created a lot of health issues because we Absolutely. paid a very little to that. The entire lead crisis of the thing. What happened, you know, in, in with our what water in the lead, right? In in what happened in Michigan? Same thing. We have created for 15 years children who will never be normal again. So the country will pay millions and billions of dollars for them to get into the next level because they're going to live for another 80 years, and which we need to support them as part of. Just because Flint decided not to get water from Rage because it costs a little more money. So. The environment plays a very little in the policy thinking, some level, and it also becomes such a polarizing issue in this country. It, is, it doesn't matter. It's, it, is, it is a bad thing. We have really taken a very proactive, active role in this entire thing because without a good environment, health cannot be maintained by any one of us. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your generous donation of time and expertise and intelligence to, for all of us. Um, I appreciate it the most. We uh, will continue in other topics, uh, open to suggestions for those other topics as to future forums. Um, thank very much, Holly Serap, Dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services uh, for that and for Hostra. And uh, there were a couple of other questions, some directly specific to FQHC, so I'll let you talk to David directly there. And another one which was a very great suggestion about how come the county government, which is, affects many of the social determinants, is not part of the DISHRIP system. So uh, a good question for the designers of the local PPS. But anyway, thank you very much. Have a good weekend. <laughs> <laughs>